Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and today we have Andrew Dow with us to discuss the topic of SOAS. This is part two in our series, and the first part we talked about just what is SOAS, and Andrew explained that pretty well to us. Now we're going to talk about how to prepare for SOAS, and this is the SEAL Officer Assessment and Selection Process. So, Andrew, uh, welcome. Thanks. Um, let, let's get right into it. So let's talk about the application process itself. What, how do I apply if I want to be a SEAL officer? How do I apply for SOAS? What are, what are some of the dates that things have to be done and, and prerequisites? Just talk to us about that. The SOAS application is, is very straightforward. All of it can be found on the SEAL OCM webpage, and you can get to the SEAL OCM webpage through SEALSWIC.com. There's different application process for different accession sources. So I'll first address the OCS, Officer Candidate School, the civilians who want to become SEAL officers. So the SOAS application, before we even start anything, in order to be a, an officer in the military, an officer in the Navy, every candidate has to have their four-year degree, right? They have to have their bachelor's degree. Whether you have your degree already or if you're just about to apply, you should start the summer prior to the applications due. So applications happen once a year. They're due to the SEAL OCM end of February. Every year it's the same. They do to the SEAL OCM end of February. So if you're an OCS applicant, you should start this application in the summer, right? So July, August, you go to the OC, uh, RO, you go to an officer recruiter, start the OCS application and work on the SOAS application. If you're NRTC and if you haven't let your chain of command know early, you start during the summer of your rising junior year. You start the SOAS application. No matter what the applications do to the SEAL OCM end of February. Once the application for any accession source is submitted, the SEAL OCM Officer Community Manager conducts a down select. This down select determines if you'll receive an invitation to SOAS or not. This happens usually the end of March, early April, and then they from there they'll have the list of who will be attending SOAS. You'll be notified early April, middle of April, if you've been invited to SOAS. After you've received your invitation, you'll attend SOAS, whether it's in July, June, July, or August. After you complete SOAS, there's a SEAL selection panel, which happens every September, where the, SEAL, the Naval Special Warfare um, senior leader will sit down with a a bunch of community officers and determine who will be selected to go to BUDS. This happens in September. Candidates will be notified if they're going to BUDS, usually in October. And then from there, it's if you're an ROTC midshipman, that October is your senior year. So you'll finish your year, you'll graduate, you'll get commissioned, then you'll go to BUDS. For OCS, you will usually attend OCS a month after receiving, receiving the selection. So you'll probably attend OCS sometime between November and April, and then you'll go to BUDS late spring to early summer. So the SOAS application, it, it, for an, an individual, I'm just, there's different accession sources for SOAS to become SEAL officers, right? I'm sp strictly gonna talk first on the officer candidate school, the OCS candidate, the civilians who wanna become SEAL officers. Um, before they can even apply and become, uh, start the SOAS application, right, they have to have their four-year degree. And that, that goes for any uh, aspiring officer in the military, whether you're gonna go become a Naval officer, Army officer, you have to have your four-year degree. So the first step they have to do is they go down to their officer recruiter at any Navy, Naval station in their hometown or whatever's local to them, and they go in and talk to our officer recruiter and say, I wanna be a SEAL officer through the OCS cap, uh, pipeline. The officer recruiter will then start their application process, but concurrently, and at, independently, but concurrently, they have to do their SOAS application, their SEAL officer assessment application. This application can be found on the SEAL OCM webpage. Um, if, if anyone has issues getting to that webpage because they have just changed the format of it, it can be very confusing to navigate. They can reach out to me. Um, I will provide my contact information to Scott. So if anyone has questions on how to get there, um, get that to them. Yeah, just shoot us an email at info at sealswick.com and we'll get that question answered. Right. 
Or they could go to the SEAL SWIC website and there's uh, a link to get to the SEAL OCM webpage with the SOAS application. OCM stands for? Officer Community Manager. The SEAL Officer Community Manager is the one who receives all the SOAS applications. So an OCS candidate, they talk to their officer recruiter and at the same time they can utilize me and I will help them with their SOAS application. So the SOAS application for an OCS candidate starts with them going to their officer recruiter. The officer recruiter will handle uh, different components of that application, but concurrently and independently, they're going to do their SOAS application. The SOAS application for an OCS candidate includes, one, they have to have their four-year degree. They have to have a PST score, the physical screening test score, that can be done by their officer recruiter who can proctor it. They have to have a resume. The resume is basically a brag sheet about the individual, right? What, what have you done prior to applying to SOAS, right? And this can be a wide range of things. Their leadership experience, their athletic background, their GPA, what majors they studied, do they speak any languages? This is the time that they get to brag about themselves. You know, check your modesty at the door. You want to basically tell on this resume everything great about yourself. And, and is that the kind of stuff that NSW is looking for? Yes, during the SOAS application, we want to see because they're looking for the individuals with athletic backgrounds, the ones with strong GPAs or bilingual or have leadership experience in the real world that they'll be able to utilize in the SEAL community. So on their, one of the components of the SOAS application is that resume. So that's, like I said, is your brag sheet. After you have the resume, you have your letter of references. Uh, you usually get two of those, and it's given to someone who knows you, who can write about, talk about you, right? Your leadership, your character, um, what have you done in life up to this point, and for them to basically talk about it. So in the past, I've told candidates some good people to write letter of references are you know, high school coaches, high school teachers, college teachers, college coaches, um, some of your mentors that, you know, that you've looked up to in the past. So it doesn't have to be you know, your local senator for instance, like Absolutely. it would be for if you're applying to the Naval Academy and you, you're getting a senator to write a letter of recommendation or some admiral somewhere, it it's, it's really has more to do with how well does that person know you so that they can evaluate you as someone that is well known versus... The whole point of a letter of references is not about the signature at the bottom. It's about the individual, the candidate, right? The, the, the person writing these LORs should know this person and be able to write good things about them. And it, just like you said, you're not looking for a senator. Hey, if you know a senator and he knows you since you were born, by all means, utilize that individual. Or if you know a four-star admiral, a four-star general who knows you and your family by first name, yeah, you can utilize those. But if you're just in passing the and you see this, this, this four-star who you were, had the chance to say hello, and then you ask, can, I, can you write a letter of reference for me? That's probably not a good idea because the, the selection panel the, sees these all the time and it's, it's frowned upon because they don't know you. You want to find someone who knows you. That's the most important thing for these letter of references. Along with the LORs, you have the OCD, which is the Officer Candidate Data Card. Um, it's basically a, a snapshot of the individual. It has the officer community manager can provide this to you and it's basically just filling in all the important highlights of your resume, of your GPA, of your leadership background, of your athletic background. It also also included is a, uh, a headshot of the candidate. So each candidate is also going to be required to provide a, uh, a headshot in business casual, right? Don't be taking a picture in board shorts and t-shirt and flip-flops, right? Look professional, because this is an interview. So it's kind of like a baseball card in a, in a way. It, right, right. It has so, your personal stats. Yes, exactly. And what you look like and yeah. your major accomplishments. Height, weight, it's gonna say uh, the degree you, uh, the four-year degree you got, if you have a master's degree, it will say that. It will say um, what you did in college, what you did in the real world of your jobs you've held and any languages you've spoken. How important is is the degree or the school that you got it from? Like I get the question all the time, what should I get a degree in? Or does it matter if I go to Stanford or Timbuktu University? Tell me. So that's a great question and 
So my opinion on this and what I've seen over the last few years on applications is your major doesn't matter. What I tell all candidates is take a major that you enjoy, take a major that you feel you'll do well in and a major that you can see yourself doing in the real world. Don't take something because it looks good on paper. You wanna have a backup plan because if this whole becoming a SEAL officer falls through, you wanna be able to do something in the real world that you enjoy, right? So if you're an art major and you enjoy that, do it. What's important is that if you're doing it, make sure you do well in it because the, bo the, the selection panel and the, the down select panel is not gonna, if you're an econ major and you have a 2.0, that's gonna show something that you didn't really care about it. But if you're a physics major and you have a 3.0, we know physics is a challenging top, a challenging degree, and for, to get a 3.0 or above is amazing. So what I tell candidates is, major doesn't matter as long as it's something you enjoy and it's a backup plan for you. Do well in it. Don't just pick a major because it's hard, because that's going to show that you didn't put effort in it if you have a low GPA. School wise, school wise is important, but. Not everyone can afford to go to Stanford. Not everyone can get a, uh, a scholarship to Notre Dame. So you do the best you can with what you have. That's what I tell applicants. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna prove yourself at SOAS. That's where the rubber meets the road for applicants trying to become SEAL officers. Just as long as it's an accredited school and not Joe's fly-by-night online university kind of thing. Exactly. Not that online degrees are uh, bad. I mean, as long as the school is Accredited. Absolutely. Yeah. So you got your four-year degree, you got your letter of references, you have your resume, right, your brag sheet, you have your PST score. In addition, there there is medical documentation that you'll need. Once you do your OCS application, you'll receive medical document, documentation that you will be required to submit with your SOAS application. These are your DD-2807 and your DD-2808 that you receive from, your officer recruiter will know what these are and he'll, he or she will be able to help you get those paperwork and submit it with your SOAS application. So the application process for OCS candidates, there's two of them. You got your OCS application and your SOAS application. I'm here for you all to answer any questions about the SOAS application and help guide you through that. Now, that's OCS in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. The other accession sources, Naval Academy, ROTC, their process is a little different. Naval Academy has their own machine. If you could get to the Naval Academy, once you get there, they'll walk you through the process. Let's talk about ROTC, the NROTC, the Navy Reserve Officer Training Corps. Basically, you go to a regular college, and some colleges have NROTC, and that is an opportunity for you to be exposed to the military lifestyle, but also go to a regular college. And it's a scholarship. Yes and no. So not every NRTC individual gets a scholarship. Usually around their second or third year, they'll get uh, the opportunity, if they did well in school since then, to get the rest paid for. But the fundamentals of ROTC for any service is, is that you're committing to uh, service as an officer in that military, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. So we, the NRTC process is everything that's required for the SOAS application, like we said, can be found on the SEAL officer community webpage. But for ROTC, for you to become a SEAL officer, you need to start your freshman year. You need to let your chain of command of your NRTC unit know that, hey, my focus and my goals is to become a SEAL officer, so I'm gonna work towards that. Because NRTC, historically, Candidates are, you know, STEM focused. They're 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 looking at mathematics and sciences and it m mechanical engineer and systems engineer, right? Because they're trying to build officers for the nuclear navy or to be pilots or to be surface warfare officers. Because the SEAL community is so tiny, it's such a small community in the Navy that it's not a foc focal point at NRTC. So it is imperative that you let your chain of command know right away that you, what your intentions are. Once you make them aware of what it is, it's can strive well, strive hard while you're at school to seek leadership positions in the NRTC. You can be a squad leader, you can be a training sergeant. You want to get as many leadership opportunities you can while you're at NRTC. And it can start your freshman year, right? Everyone, you can be a leader as a freshman or a fourth class in the NRTC ranks. Um, and that you wanna be able to write down on your brag sheet, on your resume, which is one of the requirements for the SOAS application. 
The other thing I, I want to instill and drive home, when you're at an NRTC unit, that shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. You should be striving to, if you played sports in high school, you should be playing sports in college, even if you're doing NRTC, because that's not full time. You should be able to make time to play a sport. I'm not saying go walk on the varsity Notre Dame football team. What I am saying is they have club sports, they have intramural sports, stay active, stay busy, because these are more things you can add to your resume, your application, and to brag about yourself. It also opens up different leadership positions, right? You could be a captain, you can be um, a treasurer, you can be hold a leadership position on any of these athletic teams. And is this because the board is looking at the whole man concept? Yes, yes, the whole man concept is, is one of the major things the selection panel is looking at, right? We don't want to see just the person who goes to school, does good grades and workouts in their room. We want to see the ones who are reaching out to their communities, you know, striving on the athletic field, who are also working in their NRTC units. We want to see individuals who do it all, not just single lined straight to the, I'm going college, ROTC, SEAL. No, we want to see people reaching out and doing those extracurricular activities. Yeah, like they could even be part of a student body, a student government organization. Exactly. They could exactly. be involved in a fraternity and, and do community service, right. things like this. Right. And, you know, the, a lot of applicants that we've seen specifically from NRTC aren't just NRTC, right? They're playing some sort of sport. And it doesn't have to be, like I said, Division One. It can be club. But they're staying busy. They're not just focused on school and NRTC. They're doing other things and this helps them in the end. Roger. Something I want to talk about for NRTC midshipmen specifically is, you know, you let your chain of command know that you want to go SEAL officer early on, as early as possible, right? Make, their, make, make them involved in your decision. If you go to SOAS, right, you apply your second class year and you go to SOAS during your rising senior summer, if you're not selected or if, you are, if, if you're not selected, it's not the end of the world. There's still other ways to still become a SEAL officer. One, you're going to have to, the easiest way is to lateral transfer. Put in for a surface warfare position, do your time, earn your warfare insignia, and lateral transfer from there. So it's not the end of the day. So you could still become a SEAL officer. It's just a little bit longer of a road. For those who want to become SEAL officers and don't learn about it until their junior year or sophomore year, it's okay. I mean. Uh, most, a lot of candidates know they want to do it right away, but we do get the candidates who just didn't know. Maybe their unit wasn't aware of SOAS. Um, as long as they get their application or the, if, as long as they reach out to me prior to their junior year or during their junior year before the applications are due, I can help guide them through the application process. So don't feel like if you're a junior or a sophomore that it's too late. You can start this process as a junior. Okay, so we, we kind of covered OCS yep. and NROTC. So l let me just hit on NRTC real quick. So where it really is important is when they become a second class, right, that's when the application should be submitted. So they let their chain of command know I'm submitting an application. They get it all together. They route it up to their chain of command, and then their chain of command will submit it to the CLOCM. That's their, their junior year. That's their junior year. Yeah. They will attend so as their rising senior summer. Okay. So that's NRTC and OCS we've talked about. Uh, the other application applicants that we see, right, we have our lateral transfers who are active duty uh, sailors already. Though they already have, their, their process is a little different. They have to get their chain of command approval. They have to submit a lateral transfer paperwork, um, but they don't actually lateral transfer until if they are selected for BUDS. But they have to get approval from their chain of command before they can apply. And their application process, everything the ROTC, everything the OCS has to provide, a lateral transfer has to apply, provide. As does the inner service transfers, right? We, our Marine Corps, our Army, our Coast Guard. The, our Air Force, they all have to do the same application requirements, which is on the CLOCM webpage, and submit it to the CLOCM. And any of those applicants who are, are already in the military coming from a different community, whether they're a lateral transfer from the Supply Corps or an inner service transfer from the Marine Corps uh, or, you know, inner service academy transfer from mm -hmm. the Air Force, 
if they should not make it through the SOAS selection process, they are returning to their original source, right? They're, right. You're going to go back and be an army major yep. like you were or whatever. Yep. Um, you don't, you are not, you're not transferred into the Navy as a general undesignated something. Correct. Correct. Right. So it's almost, it's not a freebie, but you get to try out for SOAS. If you do well and you go to the selection panel and they select you for BUDS, then you'll complete the inner service or lateral transfer. And then you would go to BUDS. If, if it doesn't work out and you're not selected, you'll go back to the community you just came from. Okay. So we talked a little bit about some tips for having a strong application. Um, those being, you know, making sure that your letter of referral or letter of recommendation is coming from the right source. Uh, we talked about how as a, as a student in college, you want to be involved in many different things. And I think that probably applies to all the applicants, right? They, as th since they're looking for a whole man or whole woman concept, right. they want to see people who are well-rounded, not just I'm uh, an ace at athletics or I'm um, a, a, a total egghead. But they want to see people well-rounded out, people who can demonstrate some leadership, some commitment to teamwork, things like this. Yes, yeah. And we, and it's fortunate our lateral transfers are inner service, right? They're coming from communities where they served as leaders already, right? You got your all, you got your O ones, your ensigns, lieutenant, J, uh, second lieutenants, your first lieutenants, your your lieutenant JGs, right? You have all these individuals who have leadership experience. So these are important roles that the the selection panel is looking for. That it's the whole man concept or woman concept, like you said. So I, I know that a lot of people are probably wondering, this sounds really interesting. Gosh, I want to do that. Uh, how do I train for SOAS? So there's a miss. I, I want to say that a lot of people believe that if I can just train for the PST, I will crush SOAS. That is completely false. You should train for the PST to do well on the PST, but when you're training for SOAS, you need to be focused on lots of running, lots of swimming, lots of calisthenics, and lots of body weight lifts. And if you, you're looking for a specific guide, one I'll mention um, is the, the PTG, the Physical Training Guide. Uh, it can be found on the SealSwick website. It is 26 weeks of training from start to finish and it's it, it's a good pr preparation tool to get you ready for soas because soas in a nutshell is buds without all the buds craziness of instructors yelling at your face you're going to do log pt you're going to have boats on your heads you're going to do four mile time runs you're going to do rucksack runs right so this this uh physical training guide will get you ready for that and what i tell individuals is that you know, don't you train for the PST to do well on the PST? But when you're training for SOAS, it's you shouldn't be training like you're a bodybuilder, right? You shouldn't be trying to be doing a 500 pound bench press. You should be doing body weight lifts, high reps, lightweight, long distance. Like you want to be training as if you're a half marathoner. Endurance right? training. Endurance training, exactly. So that will that is a good starting point to get you ready for SOAS. But like that PTG, the physical training guide on the SEAL SWIC, that's what I direct a lot of candidates to because it, it's a good starting point for them to get ready for SOAS. Well, I've heard the expression that BUDS is a running man's game, but also the swim is very important too. And if you don't know how to do a combat side stroke, you may be at a dis disadvantage. For those who don't know, the combat side stroke, you could just YouTube it, right? The SEAL SWIC website has some videos that can, or, and can show you the proper form. In the instruction for the PST, you can do breaststroke. That's um, one of the strokes that everyone should know, crawl stroke or freestyle, breaststroke, backstroke, all those different strokes. Combat side stroke that the PST, uh, you do the combat side stroke during the PST. You can also do the breaststroke, but the combat side stroke is occupationally relevant. It's important because it has a lot of, a lot of, importance in the SEAL teams, right? It's low, low signature. Um, you save a lot of energy using it. And let's just look at the PST. What are you going to do right after the swim? You're going to do your pull-ups, your push-ups, and sit-ups. If you're doing the breaststroke, you're going to be burning out those the chest muscles and arm muscles. The combat side stroke helps you spread out the conditioning of the entire stroke, right? So you won't be as fatigued when you're doing those evolutions, those exercises, excuse me. 
Um, but it also it, it has important value within the community in the teams, right? The combat side stroke allows you, if you're injured, right, you're still able to propel yourself with one arm or with one leg. You're able to pull your your buddy if he's injured, he or she is injured. You're able to get them out of a bad situation. It also allows you to um, move your gear silently so there's less splash in the water. That's why we try to instill in the candidates to learn the combat side stroke early. So that's what you're going with because that's what you're going to use in buds and in the teams. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to point out that, you know, when it comes to physical conditioning, learning how to train for SOAS, what should I do? Probably the best things you can do is just use the free resources on sealswick.com. You don't need to pay for an expensive gym membership or, you know, follow uh, some guy's routine, you know, pay for his subscription to do whatever. You don't need to pay for anything. Right. And, and you don't need to get caught up in, in various, you know, fitness trends. Candidates today have the luxury of the internet and there's a ton of free stuff. I mean, I had to look up manuals and figure out, oh, what do you have to do with buds? How do I get ready, right? But with these resources, totally utilize them because they will get you ready, right? You, you, it, the SEAL community is active, is an active lifestyle. So find things that can get you ready for SOAS. Um, you know, utilize the SEAL SWIC webpage and whatever whatever else is out there, you just want to be physically ready for SOAS because it is it is very challenging. It's not BUDS, but it's definitely a step to BUDS and it is very, um, it's very challenging. Okay, so last question. So we're gonna talk about, um, if I'm thinking about coming to SOAS, let's say I, I put an application, I got accepted. Now, how do I get there? I live in um, Missouri, let's say. And SOAS is conducted out here in, in Coronado, Coronado. Yep. West Coast, San Diego. How do I get myself from Missouri to San Diego? Do I have to pay for that ticket? Do they pay for me? What am I gonna eat? How am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna stay? Tell me a little bit about that, the logistics of it. Okay. Every SEAL candidate, right, they submit their application. There's a down select panel that the SEAL officer community manager conducts. And from there, individuals will receive either an invitation or not. They're either going to SOAS or not. At that point, they'll start working with me, the SOAS program manager, to, to figure out how they get here. And I'll help them. I'll walk them through the steps of how they get to SOAS. We'll determine which block you'll attend, whether it's June, July, or August. But you will... Everything will be handled for you. If it's an ROTC, your chain of command will get your orders set up, which block you'll attend, and they will fly you or drop your POV, privately owned vehicle or government vehicle, get you to SOAS. For OCS, you'll work with me. I'll we'll get you airfare. We'll get you to SOAS. Lateral transfers is a is a different case, right? If your chain of command's on board, if with you lateral transferring, maybe they'll pay for your flights. If not, you'll have to pay out of pocket. The big thing is getting to SOAS. Once you get there, everything else is handled for you. Meals will be provided, lodging is provided, everything is done in-house. So you won't have to worry about finding a hotel down out in town or where am I, where am I gonna go eat at lunch? Everything is handled because everything is on a schedule from the day you show up to the day you leave. And you mentioned um, that first day when they arrive, they're gonna get checked in and they're gonna get issued all the clothing and gear that they're going to need during SOAS? Yeah, so once everyone arrives, if you're arriving at the airport, uh, Naval Special Warfare Center, the assessment team for SOAS will get you a shuttle from the airport or pick you up at the front gate of NAB Coronado and get you to your lodging, your barracks, where you'll be staying. Once all the candidates for that SOAS block gets there, you will go and get gear issued where you'll get everything you'll need for SOAS. The there, Prior to coming to SOAS, you'll receive a warning order. We call it a warno. That will provide a gear list of things you will be required to bring, like your toiletries, sleeping bag, pillow, change of clothes from running shoes, um, just you know, things that, you, that we will not be able to provide you. Once everyone gets here, we'll go get your gear issue, your uniforms, your boots, your, uh, your fins, your wetsuits, your canteens, everything you'll need for SOAS will be provided to you on that first day you check in. That actually brings up a nice um, side question. I, I, I get asked a lot: uh, Can when when I when I go to SOAS, can I bring you know my medications or my vitamins or my 
shoe insoles. On this warning order, it will tell you everything you need to do. If there's a prescription that you're required to take, right, just like in anything, you'll, you'll check it into our medical department and they'll issue it as needed. Supplements are not authorized at SOAS, right? If you're taking creatine or power uh, whey protein or anything, you should stop that before coming to SOAS. That's, that's not authorized. That's not authorized at BUDS. It's not authorized at SOAS. Insoles, that's a great question. Something I suggest to all candidates before they come to SOAS is, and what, quite, and what I'm always asked is, are boot, boots gonna be issued? And I tell all candidates, buy your own boots. Spend the $150, $180 on boots because you wanna come to SOAS with a pair of boots broken in. Because if you come and they'll issue you boots, but you're gonna be running with bloody feet because these shoes are not broken in. And by the time they're broken in, you're gonna be heading home. So get your own pair of boots. Right now, Buds is issuing the Nike SFB Generation 2 all black non Gore Tex boot. I would highly suggest you go and get that. I would highly suggest you do this early on. Once you receive an invitation, get them and start breaking them in because you want to come to SOAS with broken in boots. Insoles. When I went through Buds, we would, every person that went before me said, get insoles. Insoles are so important. Um, depending on what foot, uh, what size foot, or what type of uh, foot you have, if you have flat foot, arch foot, um, there's tons of different insoles in there. You want to, I highly suggest you purchase a nice insole that you can put in your boot and make sure you pre, you know, work out in it prior to coming to SOAS because the most, the thing you're gonna be utilizing the most at BUDS and SOAS is your feet. And if your feet get destroyed, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. Hey Andrew, that sounds great. I appreciate you coming in here today and talking to us about the SOAS application process. And SOAS is really important for anyone who wants to be a SEAL officer. So we will continue this series um, about SOAS. Um, next, we will talk about the actual SOAS experience, what you can expect during that two weeks here at Coronado on the grinders of buds and the sand dunes of Coronado. That's it for today. I'm Scott Williams, and we'll see you next time on The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. There's nowhere to hide in Hell Week, gents. If you've been skating through bugs so far, you will not do so any longer. Get your butt down. Get off your knees.